Marty, let me um, introduce myself. I'm Ben McCarr, um, and uh, I'm the director of the uh, Energy Centre for Business School. And let me welcome everybody to the Business School uh, and to our final uh, series, uh, Energy Matters 2014. Um, and uh, before introducing tonight's speaker, let me just again, once again, acknowledge the uh, tremendous support that the Energy Education Trust has uh, given us over the, over the period of support. Now, um, Dr. Sean Simpson uh, is the Chief Scientific Officer and co-founder of Lanzatech. Um, and uh, Sean has a PhD from the University of York. Now, I'm not sure, is it in chemistry or chemical engineering? No, it's in uh, tomatoes. Frankly <laughs> 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 related, uh, and uh, his interest in bio um, developments led him to work in research facilities in Japan, Switzerland, Vienna, uh, before coming to uh, New Zealand, where he worked on ethanol production from hardwoods uh, with Gen uh, Genesis. Genesis mm. um, and. Uh, Lanzatech was founded in 2005, uh, and Sean told us today that he has led four funding rounds um, uh, associated with bringing Lanzatech to uh, commercialisation, which I guess we will hear about in the presentation that's ahead of us. Um, Harvey Week also mentioned tonight that uh, Lanzatech is ranked number one in the bio. <laughs> Bio. <laughs> 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 there you go. Number one in the clean tech energy industries in the United States. So that's an amazing accomplishment for a, uh, a New Zealand-born uh, 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 company. Lanzatech is now based in Chicago, uh, and um, Sean um, travels back to New Zealand frequently, and he is a really passionate supporter of commercialisation in the biotech space. So please welcome Sean to the meeting. So first, um, first I should turn on the microphone. First I should um, thank Basil uh, wholeheartedly for, for the invitation and Amanda Staines for the amazing uh, coordination. Um, and, and then clarify that uh, my PhD really was in tomatoes. Uh, so there was a time when I was one of the ten the world's experts on how a tomato fruit ripens, um, which turns out to be not very interesting. So, I'm going to go on that. <laughs> so true story. Um, so, the talk, to, talk today, the talk today. The talk today is. Um, so, you have to bear with me on this. So. I uh, arrived this morning at 5 a.m. Uh, I slept a bit on the plane, so I left Chicago yesterday. So I'm kind of high on coffee, uh, <laughs> and tired, and I've never really given this talk, so I'm you know, <laughs> not really sure how this is going to go. But effectively, I'll present a little about climate change. Uh, it really knows to present a great deal about climate change these days, which is great. Uh, and I'll talk then about the sustainable fuels industry, such as it is, Really, not, not so much from the perspective of technology, more from the perspective of feedstocks. I'll then present Lanzatech uh, and, and do that in a, in a completely shameless way. And then uh, I'll talk a little bit about the aviation industry and why uh, renewable, sustainable fuels are important to, to, to the aviation <laughs> industry particularly. Uh, and I'll finish off with some sort of rambling thoughts on uh, what's next and, and what to think about from, from my personal perspective. Um, so here it goes. Uh, so carbon, carbon, it's, it's kind of everywhere. Uh, the, the, we're all carbon in this room, and uh, hopefully. And, <laughs> and, um, uh, and we, can't, we can't live without it. But we know, of course, uh, that it's problematic when, when we burn it. It's problematic because when we burn carbon-containing uh, um, materials, we end up releasing uh, CO2 into the atmosphere. It's accumulating in the atmosphere now to a point where it's becoming dangerous to human health. It's becoming environmentally uh, uh, extremely troublesome and it's going to have serious economic impacts as we go forward. But not only that, perhaps in many areas of the world, perhaps the, the most immediate 
uh, impact of the combustion of, of carbon-rich materials is actually pollution, so the release of SOx, NOx, etc., and uh, particulate matter that are now really choking up the air in many cities, and that's becoming one of the major drivers and the major urgencies around, uh, uh, around uh, environmental legislation. The, 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 as I said, climate change is happening. Uh, it's very clear. Uh, no need to talk about it. Uh, it's, it's, it's like uh, we don't need to argue about this the same way we don't have to argue about evolution. Um, and, and we know that, uh, uh, we know that uh, of course, the, the, the energy sector, the, the fuel sector in particular, the, the, the use of, of fuels, our reliance on fuels, is something that's going to have to, uh, is going to, have to change as we go forward and we're going to have to find more sustainable fuels uh, to, to fuel our vehicles um, because the combustion of fuels releases CO2 and therefore we have to find some ways of producing fuels that have a lower, much lower CO2 profile and in fact the International Energy Agency is, is putting uh, figures around this saying you know really what we've got to do is, uh, is displace at least 30% of our fuel pool with low carbon fuels. They say zero carbon fuels but we're talking low carbon fuels for at least 30% of our, our fuel pool. But what does that mean? What does that mean in practical terms? And, <coughs> and, and what's the challenge associated with this? What this means is that we've got to find 450 billion gallons of very low carbon fuels fast. And, and this is a number I'm going to keep coming back to. Um, and this number is derived from the fact that today, as, uh, as a globe, we consume uh, around 90 million barrels of oil per day. Consume, burn, and that all goes in the atmosphere, and it's becoming problematic. 30% of that is uh, 1.2 um, uh, billion gallons, let's call it, um, and or 450 per day, or 450 billion gallons annually. So that's a, that's a, that's a pretty serious target. And, and, and the seriousness of that target, and the reason for me to focus this talk on feedstocks for f renewable fuel production will become evident as a function of that target. Of course, the use of sustainable fuels is being incentivised globally. Yeah? So governments are mandating that we need to include low carbon or sustainable. Actually, what they're saying is biofuels. And we'll come back, and I'll keep, I'll keep, I'm going to keep pounding on this word biofuels, and you'll see me highlighted in red in this talk. And there's a reason for that, and we'll come to that at the end. But we, we, the, the point of this slide is to say governments are mandating the use of, of sustainable fuels. And that, of course, is a great thing because it's driven an industry, driven an awareness, and driven a market uh, for these fuels in many, many different countries uh, around the world. Today, we really only have a, few, a, a limited number of routes via which we can produce uh, low carbon or sustainable or biofuels. We have the fermentation of, of, uh, of either, of basically sugars, carbohydrates, sugars, uh, into uh, fuel ethanol. Or we have the conversion of oils um, uh, into biodiesel. And I'll talk about the relative numbers, but, but let's be clear, these are the only mature technologies that we have available today. That's, that's, that's all we've got right now. Uh, and I'll present that industry, but we are developing processes that allow us to access a broader array of feedstocks. And they include lignocellulose, I'll present a little on that, waste gases, and that's the, the Lanzatec process, uh, uh, and, and algae. And these, uh, between them, these, uh, the, the use of these different feedstocks uh, is, is, is being looked at in the context of, of both transport fuels for ground transportation and, 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 and aviation. I'll start with ethanol, world's favourite biofuel, it's produced in, in huge volumes around the world, relatively, uh, and it's produced, it really is produced globally. And if you look at a graph like this, you'd be thinking that it's made from all sorts of materials in all sorts of different places. In reality, um, three quarter, at least um, uh, half of, of, of the uh, fuel ethanol in the world is made from corn in the US. Um, around a quarter is, is made from uh, sugar in Brazil. And the rest is made uh, from, um, uh, from wheat or cassava or sugar beet. But these are relatively small, these are produced in relatively small amounts compared to 
corn in the US, sugar cane in Brazil. And, uh, and so in the US, when the, the production stands at around 13 point something billion gallons, and in Brazil, uh, at around 6 point something billion gallons per annum. So we're starting to get a sense, if we go back to our number, a number is 450 billion gallons per annum, we're starting to get a sense of the, the mountain we, we, we still need to climb. Yeah? Biodiesel, biodiesel is made uh, today primarily um, uh, from, uh, from uh, canola or rapeseed oil, uh, soy oil, uh, uh, some palm oil. Actually, when I, was, when I was preparing for this talk, I was surprised at how little is actually produced from, from palm, given the, the, the degree of controversy around the use of that, uh, that feedstock. But the majority is made from, uh, from rapeseed oil. But the total global t production today uh, sits at around 5 billion gallons. Now, you'll notice that the feedstock I've been feedstocks I've been presenting up until now uh, are all basically farmed foods. Yeah? These, are, these are the products of, of, uh, of, of agriculture and they are both expensive and they are price volatile. So this is, this is actually two graphs uh, um, that present uh, corn prices and versus uh, ethanol. Corn is in the blue, ethanol is in the, in the uh, whatever that colour is, gold. Um, and um, in the US, from where are we here? From two th from '09 to to to, the, to early this year, and this here is sugar world sugar prices. Um, uh, the world is is the red, and and the U.S. is is in blue. The point being is that these prices are highly volatile. They've become increasingly volatile recently, uh, which is which is interesting. And I'll I'll show some data later that uh, will go some way to to explain that. I believe. Uh, but the point is, they are price volatile. They are expensive, they're price volatile. And, um, uh, and they come with this incumbence of, uh, of forcing us to make a decision between the dinner plate and the fuel tank. Um, so this is, not, this is not an argument that's going to go away. This is a, this is a real argument. And, uh, and you know, it's, 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 it's a reality for these fuels. If we're going to scale renewable fuel production, we can't do it at the expense uh, of, of food. And, uh, and why can't we do it at the expense of food? Because right now, 18%, nearly 20% of sugar in the world is used for fuel production. So think about, so think about get, let's, let's go back to our numbers here. So, so sugar today produces, what was that, six point something billion gallons, and our target's 450 billion gallons per annum. You know, it's, and, and right now we're using, let's call it a fifth of the sugar harvest for, for fuel production. Yet, yeah. I'm no math genius, but we're not going to get there <laughs> with sugar. Um, so it is, this is, a, this, is a, this is a question of feedstock. This is, this is a, a, a discussion about feedstocks and what feedstocks we can use for the production of fuels. Um, the other staggering thing here is, of course, that our population isn't going down globally. Yeah? Our population is going up. <laughs> and our demand for fuel is going up. Over the same time period that we're talking for, that people predict the world's population is going to go from 7 billion to 8.6 billion, over that same time period, people predict, the, the prediction is, that the demand for energy is going to go up by around 40%. So our 450 billion gallons per year number is a target that's moving, and it's moving in one direction. And I talked a, bit, a little bit about the, the price volatility. This probably explains to some degree the price volatility and what you see. This is just stops in 2008, and I, I couldn't... You know, this is, this is obviously a talk that's been made by Google, yeah? Um, <laughs> but uh, but uh, it's, it, what, what I'm just highlighting here is the, the, the dramatic uh, impact that uh, legislation's had on global biofuel uh, production. This presents both bioethanol and diesel uh, over, over recent times. And obviously, the production's gone, gone significantly up. Um, and uh, for, for all the reasons mentioned around, uh, around the mandates, but also the drive around climate change. But, of course, where we got to, with, despite this dramatic uplift in, in production, we've got to 6% of our target of 450 billion gallons annually. So we need other ways. <laughs> so right now we have a feedstock challenge, yeah? 
we need to be able to use new feedstocks to be able to new, use new feedstocks, new inputs for, uh, for fuel production, low carbon fuel production. We need technologies, because today's technologies are clearly not enough because they access feedstocks that we need to eat and we don't need to drive on. Uh, and, uh, and ultimately, of course, the lowest cost technology will dominate uh, reality. So one of the ideas that's been kicking around for a very long time, I remember going to biofuel conferences in uh, uh, 10 years ago, and uh, we were, everybody was tremendously excited about lignocellulose, and you know, every, 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 I used to go, go to this conference every year, and every year the, the, the conference would kind of finish with, you know, guys, we're going to be constructing a, a, a facility, building, uh, constructing a facility that makes uh, ethanol from lignocellulose in the next two years. And every year we'd say that for the last 10 years. Turns out, this year we were right. <laughs> this year we really did build some facilities doing this. The point I wanted to make here is what is lignocellulose? Lignocellulose is basically any plant that's not either an algae or a moss. So any, any plant that stands up more than an algae or a moss is made of lignocellulose, lignin plus cellulose. Um, it's basically 60% cellulose. cellulose. Think of cellulose as a chain of sugar. So it's a, a, sh a sugar polymer, carbohydrate polymer, uh, hemicellulose, same thing. Uh, and lignin is effectively the closest thing that, uh, that grows that looks like coal. Yeah? So, and plants have evolved over millions of years, unfortunately, to have these two things intrinsically bound together and inseparable as a defense against the world. Um, our challenge when we want to use lignocellulose as a raw material for fuel production is the first step is to separate this thing that has spent billions of years evolving to become uh, a, uh, an inseparable mass. So first challenge, separate it. Then sacrification, what does sacrification mean? It means chopping the, the cellulose into to monomeric sugars, and then we ferment the same way we ferment any kind of sugar. So separation, sacrification, and fermentation. That, those are the three challenges that, the, that we as, as a scientific or technical community have faced around the use of lignocellulose, woody biomass, uh, for, for fuels. And so a plant that, that uh, uses lignocellulose looks something like this, whereby uh, obviously you have aggregation of, of the lignocellulose, and they tend to concentrate on single uh, or individual types of, of biomass. So they'll tend to concentrate on a particular type of grass. Corn stover is a popular one, obviously, in the States, um, because it's, it's the stuff left behind after a, uh, a field of corn has been harvested. And uh, they, they'll concentrate on a particular type of biomass. They'll have a pretreatment that involves blasting apart the lignin and the cellulose. Then they'll have an enzymatic treatment to break that cellulose down into, uh, into monomeric sugars and then the, a standard fermentation, which has to overcome the various difficulties of, of having this kind of m gamish of, of, a, of a feedstock that's kind of got bits of the breakdown products of lignin in there and there's all kinds of uh, inhibitors. There's been a number of challenges faced al al along the way, but these have been overcome. And this year, some bizarre coincidence, three lignocellulose to ethanol plants have been constructed and, will, and by the end of this year will be operational. Those three are by DuPont uh, in, in Nevada, Abengoa, um, a, a, a Spanish company originally actually, but um, uh, built a, a place in, in Kansas, and uh, Project Liberty, don't you love that name, uh, in, um, <laughs> in, in Iowa, and that's DSM. Po DSM is uh, a, uh, an enzyme uh, manufacturer, so they're supplying uh, the sort of microbial and enzymatic technology, and Poet are a, uh, a dyed-in-the-wool corn ethanol manufacturer uh, who are trying to get into to, to, uh, the lignocellulosic space. These guys have, have, have done it. They've constructed plants. Now, these are the first of a kind, yeah? So these aren't going to be the most efficient plants in the world. They're not going to be the best plants in the world. They are, this, is the, this is the first stake in the ground saying, we can convert wood into fuels at a, a reasonable scale. What do we mean by reasonable scale? We're talking about 30 million gallons, 25 million gallon kind of scale. Now, this is small for a corn ethanol plant. Corn ethanol plants today are 100 million gallons scale. That's what, that's what you'd build if you're building a corn ethanol plant today. But we're not expecting to start off with the 100 million gallon scale. We're expecting to start off something a little more modest because we're trying to perfect the technology. The challenges that face this industry still, and, this, you know, and, and again, 
an industry starts, it's not gonna, it doesn't start from with the most efficient process in the world, the most cost reduced process in the world. It starts with a process that works and then it gets better. And, uh, and so the challenges these guys face are around op the, the operational cost, the cost of, of, uh, of, of, of buying the, the, the biomass, of breaking it apart and of, of digesting it. The capital costs, some of the capital costs here uh, that have been reported are high. So we're talking $10 an annual gallon. So you think about a plant producing 30 million gallons a year, that's $300 million to build that plant. Now that's, that's, a, 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 that's significantly more expensive than a corn ethanol plant of equivalent volume. Yeah? Uh, breadth, so the, ac being the ability to access a breadth of, of lignocellulosic resource, a breadth of, of feedstocks. They tend to be very, very specific and the technologies they develop to process feedstocks are very specific to individual uh, plant uh, species. Uh, and yield. The yield is also always going to be challenged by the fact that 40% of your feedstock cannot be used for fuel production, that 40% being the lignin component of that feedstock. And so that right now is generally just burned for, for power. So those are the challenges, but, uh, but we've got, we, we, the, the journey started and, and, the, uh, and the process of, of reducing these costs or, and overcoming some of these uh, challenges has really begun. And I think it's, this, is, this is a tremendously exciting time. Fuels from algae oil, there's, there's a number of players in this game, fa Sapphire and uh, I say Solarzyme with some trepidation, I'll explain that, uh, are, are two companies. Here, of course, this is, this is addressing a problem at its source. This is taking CO2 directly out of the atmosphere and, uh, and fermenting uh, and, and converting that CO2 into a, an oil or into uh, a, an alcohol, as, I, as I'll present next, um, using, the using energy from sunlight. So it's photosynthesis for the production of either an oil that can be used for biodiesel or jet, or an alcohol that can be used, th that's ethanol, that can be used to displace gasoline. Um, it's great because, of course, it's directly using CO2 as, as the carbon source for fuel production. Tremendous. No competition with food or feed. Tremendous. Um, and can use CO2 that's come straight from a source, like a, like a coal-fired power station. Great. Um, I, I say I'm, I, I approach Solarzyme with some trepidation uh, because... Solarzyme are, are always in the news about, uh, about the fact that they're, they're using algae to produce fuels. Um, the fact is they use algae, but they feed them with sugar. So <laughs> this, is not, this is not a traditional algal process. Um, cyanobacteria are the other, uh, this is, uh, don't you love this name? Alginol. We don't use algae. Uh, we use a cyanobacteria, a bacteria, a photosynthetic bi bacteria. Uh, so there's two companies in this space. Um, Two major companies, but there's others. These are just examples: Algenol and Juul, uh, and both use a cyanobacteria. It's a, uh, a, a bacteria, a photosynthetic bacteria that it doesn't accumulate oils to the degree of, uh, of an algae. What it does is, is produce ethanol, and that e ethanol is secreted into the media. Um, and 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 like algae, you know, you're using CO2 directly. You're uh, you're avoiding any impact on on arable land or, or or food. And so from that perspective, this is great. This is a technology that's a way off, though, and the, the, the part of the, some of the reasons for, for the, the distance to commercialization here are the fact that we've got to overcome some serious challenges around water. So these are, these are organisms that grow in water, and, uh, and you've got to separate your product from water. The, the, the lipids have to be separated from water. You've got to dewater a lot of stuff to get at your lipids. The alcohol has to be separated from a lot of water. They, they tend to produce alcohol at very low concentrations in, in, um, uh, in water. Land is a major issue. We're talking 7,000 gallons, let's call it 7,000 gallons, uh, uh, some of the numbers I've heard, uh, of, it, of, of fuel production per acre. So now let's think of our, our, our modest ethanol plant at 30 million gallons per annum, and you know, um, again, Mass isn't my thing, but uh, I'm thinking that's a big number. <laughs> so land is an issue. And then location. Yeah, so you've got to find a location that's sunny, that has a, a, a major source of, and a major source of, of, of CO2. And so this is, not, this is not something that's going to be applicable in large swathes of, of, of northern Europe uh, uh, or Russia or, or North America. 
this is not a technology that's, that's suitable to, for places with, with low incident sunlight. Uh, it's, 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 it's highly suited to the Middle East or uh, deserts in Australia, for example. But there's some good places to, to do this. Those are the th so in terms of feedstock, directly using CO2, algae, lignocellulose, we're, 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 on, that, we're on the road. I'll, I'll talk about Lanzatec and, you, and you'll understand a little bit about why I've focused on feedstock because Lanzatec was a company, our company was founded not on the, on the basis of a technology but actually a ba a, a founded with a, a feedstock philosophy, if you like, it sounds very grand, but it was a, <laughs> it was a conversation in a pub about what was the best, what's the best thing from which to produce a sustainable fuel. And we didn't know what it was, but we had a list that kind of described it. Uh, so Richard and I, the, uh, um, who, who founded the company, we sat down and we said, right, what's, what, what, would, what would be the feed, what the ideal feedstock would it look like? And, uh, and three pints in, this is the, the list. Uh, it's a feedstock that's available today, so we're not planting new crops. That was, that was one of the big bugbears. We were both plant scientists, didn't want to have to go into crop science. Uh, it was available today. It's avail available uh, um, in, in very high volumes. It's, it's abundant. Uh, you know, you're not making uh, uh, small, small quantities of fuel, aren't interesting. It has to be point source. What does that mean? It has to be something that's available in a single location. We didn't want to have to deal with transport costs. Transport costs are a, 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 a real big feature of, uh, of, of any biomass, whatever it is, corn, lignocellulose, to fuel process. Because you get a, there's a tyranny of distance. Uh, you get to a certain distance, a certain radi ratio, a radius around your plant after, uh, uh, that, that you can no longer afford to transport uh, those crops over. So is that, was that 10 miles, is it 100 miles, whatever it is, you've got a radius about, uh, and that defines your, your, your capture area. So point sourced, if everything's available in a single location, you're better off. Low value, turns out no one likes paying a lot for fuel, can understand that, and so we didn't want to be in the situation of turning gold into silver. Um, and non-food, of course, we've been talking about non-food, makes sense. And so when you get this list together, what you realise that you're talking about is is waste materials. We're talking about industrial waste gases. We're talking about municipal solid waste. Um, we're talking about ag agricultural waste. All of which fill the, fit, uh, fit those criteria and all of which are either available right now or can be easily converted into gases. Industrial waste gas obviously exists as a gas, both municipal side waste and uh, and for example, agricultural residues can be gasified to produce a gas, and that gas is a mixture of carbon monoxide and hydrogen. Steel mill off gases, for example, are pretty much only carbon monoxide, whereas, uh, whereas gasified biomass, gasified municipal side waste is, is, is various mixtures of carbon monoxide and hydrogen. So then we had this challenge, yeah, so then we had this problem, okay, so we've de defined what we need to do, we want to convert gases into fuels and chemicals, how do, you, you know, how do we do that? Um, and we're plant scientists, so uh, we, we uh, instantly avoided any kind of plant-based uh, technology because we knew that wasn't going to work. So, so we went on this sort of hunt for, for a biology, a microbiology that could do this. And for, for this hunt is really a kind of hunt through time. And so here's, here's the history of the Earth here. This is the, bit that, this is the part of the talk that's the history lesson. Um, history of the Earth, so Earth is formed, yeah, 4.8 something billion years ago. Um, then, then we have the, the dinosaurs, so they came along sort of 400 million years ago, uh, and they hung around for a while. Uh, they, they sort of left again about 100 million years ago, for reasons uh, unknown. And, um, uh, and then we came along sort of 60 million years ago, just to sort of put it all in perspective. So, so this <laughs> didn't happen, yeah? Okay, it d disturbs me, this woman looks like P Sarah Palin. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so over this period, over this period, the, the Earth's had three atmospheres. Uh, we started off with a very reduced atmosphere, and the, the, the really awake people in the audience are starting to get a clue here. Then we went to the carbon dioxide atmosphere, uh, and then the, the, through the, the evolution, uh, there's that word again, um, uh, of, of photosynthesis, we have, we, we were... Uh, we, we now uh, luxuriate in our oxygen-rich atmosphere, but of course we're busily trying to get back to that former atmosphere that we like so much, <laughs> the carbon dioxide-rich one. Um, but life on Earth is thought to have begun uh, uh, around 
3.8-ish, 3 point something, I mean, who's really sure, give or take a billion, uh, years ago. Um, and it's thought to have begun in uh, a certain type of hydrothermal vent deep in the ocean where there's a confluence of various metal ions, hot uh, uh, gases, and gases that are, that are both energy rich, so you've got carbon monoxide, you've got methane, you've got hydrogen, uh, you've got hi uh, uh, hydrogen sulfide coming together with these uh, various uh, metal, uh, metals uh, and, uh, and this heat, and, and in this kind of cauldron, if you like, in the deep uh, primordial sea, um, complex molecules started to form, complex mo molecules started to form with regular patterns, those regular patterns started to interact, and slowly over a very, 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 very long period of time, these evolved into early organisms, and these early organisms used gases as their sole source of carbon and energy. The first organisms were gas eaters. The earliest biochemistry was one that allowed gases to be utilized as a source of both carbon energy, carbon and reducing equivalents. And it's this, it's this biochemistry that is still found today in certain <coughs> organisms, these organisms called acetogens, that we leverage in our process. And these organisms are able to use quite flexibly different mixtures of both carbon monoxide and hydrogen. And that allows us to quite flexibly offer a way of producing fuels from various feedstocks, from industrial waste gases through municipal solid waste uh, through uh, uh, to, to agricultural waste. And, 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 and the really good news is, of course, that the, the, the primordial sea looked a bit like some of the places I get to visit. Uh, <laughs> so this is, this is a picture of a steel mill, anywhere you like in the world. Um, and, uh, and, and it is an environment that's filled with carbon monoxide, hydrogen carbon dioxide, uh, hydrogen sulfide, and methane. And, and all of these are uh, uh, a, a manna from heaven for a, an acetogenic bacteria. So we've developed a process, and, and by developed, I mean we, we developed both the biology and the engineering to, to scale up a process that allows gases to be used as the sole source of carbon energy for fuel production. And in the first instance, I'm talking about fuel ethanol. I'm talking about ethanol, but we also produce a four-carbon chemical called 2,3-butanediol, which I, I can't remember if I mentioned here, but we do. Um, just quickly, potted history of the company. We've, we've been very lucky in raising funds. The company was founded in 2005. I think one of the things that we've done, we've been lucky, we've, we've had a good opportunity to do, and we've, and we've done very aggressively, is patent our technology. Uh, when we entered this space, there were, I think, five or six uh, patents in the area of gas fermentation, and we went in very aggressively and patented, patented very hard, and uh, I guess one of the things I, I, I find myself uh, banging on about is that uh, patenting is, is something that here in New Zealand we need to do much better. Um, and so that's, that's, uh, that's a take home if you like. Uh, our CEO is Dr. Jennifer Holmgren. She joined the company in 2010 and really took what at that time was an interesting technology through to becoming uh, a very uh, exciting sort of close to commercial uh, uh, process. And, and, and it's been a real privilege to be part of a journey with Jennifer. Our process has been proven with industrial off-gases, with um, uh, reformed uh, methane, with gasified municipal solid waste, um, uh, biomass, and in future we are looking at the use of CO2 as a source of carbon and alternative sources of energy such as hydrogen or even electrons, and I'll, I'll mention that briefly later on. I said uh, our organism produces this, this peanut here, that's the organism, um, um, that produces both ethanol and 2,3-butanediol, um, and, uh, and we can toggle between the two. So we can, we can operate the process such as we increase selectivity for ethanol or we increase selectivity for 2,3-butanediol. So, uh, and that's without modification in the first instance. We scaled the process up, so we started off with the process in the lab with a, uh, a test tube, uh, an organism that we bought from a culture collection. We selected for strains that, that performed, uh, had, in, had improved performance, and we scaled up firstly uh, in our lab at sort of five or, or, or ten litre scale, then to a pilot plant that we built in, in, uh, in Gle the, the steel mill at Glenbrook in New Zealand. Um, in New Zealand, in Glenbrook, we're in New Zealand, um, <laughs> and uh, in 2008, frankly, we had no idea what we were doing then. Imagine, we started off in 2005 with a test tube and no idea what we were doing, and then in 2008, we built a pilot plant. We definitely had no idea what we were doing, and, uh, but it was very, very successful because whilst we had no idea what we were doing, we built something that was 
of a decent size and we had to fix it, we had to overcome the challenges and we had to overcome the challenges in the context of a gas that came from a steel mill and in the context of scale and not in the context of a beautiful white lab, white coated lab uh, with everything looking immaculately clean. And it turns out that when you bring a Chinese steel maker over from China and, uh, and you introduce him to this process that's going to transform his steel industry and you take him into your beautiful lab and you show him this bubbling reactor, he looks at you like you're mad. You're like, oh, what the fuck has this got to do with me? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, well, I don't know, you know, I don't get it. How does this work? Then you take him to the steel mill where it's filthy and noisy and horrible and, and he loves it and he gets it because there's the steel mill and there's your process and it's working. And so it became probably our, our greatest marketing tool as, as much as, uh, as, much as our, our, our learning ground for scale up. We then scaled up to a pre-commercial demo, which we've, we've actually operated two of these uh, in, uh, uh, in China. We operate another demo in Taiwan. And this year, uh, we will be breaking ground, uh, touching all things wooden, um, in, uh, uh, with our first commercial operation. We focused on the steel industry in the first instance. Why did we do that? Because there was a steel mill in New Zealand that wasn't a gasifier. And so we had access to steel making off gases and we were desperate to make our process relevant to an established available feedstock and our, our feedstock view of the world. Steel industry is interesting. 300 billion gallons of ethanol capacity. Go back to our number. That's annual e ethanol production potential from the steel industry alone. Now, that assumes lots of things, like we, we get to build a plant at every single steel mill in the world and use all of their gas, which is unlikely, but that's the potential. Um, it's, 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 it's tremendous. We've formed two joint ventures in China uh, with two major steel companies, Bao Steel, probably the largest steel maker in China, and Shaogang, fourth largest steel maker in China, both using different uh, um, off gases decided to build, or different gas sources decided they wanted to build a demonstration plant and uh, we've operated those in the last two years and they e in each case hit the ball out of the park in terms of operations and, and you know actually I don't know of another process where the demo uh, actually performed uh, beyond its, its spec and, and, and that, was, that was really satisfying and not, not that it was easy, it was <laughs> it, was, it was horrible, uh, but, uh, but we did it, and, and here's some data, so, um, and this is probably why I'm nervous about the camera, but um, <laughs> the, 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 this is two months of data, continuous production uh, at one of our plants, and what I wanted to show here is not that, okay, we've been producing for two months continuously from a real live feed from a steel mill. What I wanted to show is actually that, you know, shit happens. And, and when you're operating a plant in the real world at scale from a process that you developed at, at, a, at a tiny uh, um, test tube in a laboratory, you have no idea what you're going to face when you get to the real world because it turns out, this is very frustrating, that the steel mill doesn't actually operate its mill to help you. They just want to make steel. <laughs> and, and so they keep turning the thing off when it suits them. And, um, uh, or, 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 or changing the process or having a new, uh, new contaminant in the gas that they didn't tell you about. And so, you know, when you're operating there for continuously for two months, you get to experience all of this stuff. And if you've got a great team, which fortunately we do, we're able to overcome those processes, those, those challenges they occur. We have another operation in, in Taiwan, same sort of thing. Um, we have also dedicated a, a lot of effort to maximizing the efficiency of the process such that we consume the maximum amount of gas, gas in our specialized bioreactor in a single pass. Very, very important because you don't want to be recycling gas, you want to be consuming it all in one go. So now we can actually consume sort of over 90% of the feed gas in a single pass in our reactor. Um, I won't talk about that now. Uh, so <coughs> environmental impact. We have a CO2 impact. We also have an impact, and I'll talk about, about the CO2 impact later, but one of the things I think is really important that from a, and I mentioned this earlier, is in places like China, in the major cities in China, the, the, the driver for environmental legislation it turns out not to really be global warming. It turns out to be the fact that the air is uh, toxic. Uh, and, and so you've got to deal with, you've got to deal with air pollution uh, before you deal with anything else. And, and, and legislation has to be put in place to deal with that, and it's going to be. And, and one of the things that, that we've been promoting, of course, is that our process really does that. From the steel industry, the steel mill today has obviously it makes steel, it produces a bunch of gases, it can use those gases for electricity generation, 
uh, and, and feed the grid, or it can use those gases in a process like ours. Our process allows 33% uh, less CO2 to be emitted um, per megajoule of energy recovered. That's, that's a good thing. Um, but it also allows 80% fewer particulates uh, and 40% less NOx to be emitted from that steel mill. So now you're really talking about having an, uh, an impact on the immediate uh, environmental uh, issues that associate with, with large-scale industrial production. Greenhouse gas. Um, the, all of our, all of our uh, carbon life cycle analysis are done by third parties. Uh, we've had these validated by the Roundtable for Sustain Sustainable uh, Biomaterials. And, and we see a 50 to 70% reduction in greenhouse gas as CO2 emission uh, through the use of ethanol to displace gasoline, obviously displace oil uh, from our process. And of course, there's a good economic case such that we can offer 2x uh, the revenue per volume of gas processed that can be offered for, uh, that, that can be generated by um, power generation, or that can, that can be derived from power generation. We have a, we have a, a route to, to, to chemicals. I, I won't spend too long on this, but the 2 3 butane dial can be used as an intermediate for the production of 1 3 butadiene. Uh, 1 3 butadiene is a very large, uh, 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 or is a chemical intermediate used for the production of rubber. Uh, so uh, it's, it's a market around uh, $22 billion a year. And we have uh, partnerships with the likes of SK, Invista, and a company called Orochem to process 2 3 butane dial into 1 3 butadiene. And, um, uh, and, and, and supply it to Invista, who are the world's major uh, nylon uh, producer. And we have a focus on, 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 uh, on synthetic biology to engineer the microbe uh, to, to allow us to produce new and exciting materials from the same gas resources that we can access. And I think this is, uh, you know, this is something we've put a lot of effort into. We've, we've made great progress. The, the natural microbe makes ethanol 2 3 butane dial. Now we can offer the production of, for example, isopropanol, which is a precursor for propylene, polypropylene plastics, um, acetone, butanol, uh, 3-HB, um, so on and so forth. Go, the list goes on. So today we've produced around 20 different molecules from this organism by engineering the pathways in the organism to redirect carbon into, uh, it, it, into, into, into new products. This to me is, is, is tremendously exciting. Why is it exciting? Because we're able now, if we're producing, for example, plastics from these gases, we're talking about carbon capture and utilization, carbon capture and, uh, uh, and monetization. Carbon becomes uh, a feedstock, a real feedstock. And carbon monoxide is very clearly the precursor to carbon dioxide. Carbon monoxide only ever ends its life as carbon dioxide basically from an from industrial source. Um, and so if, if you can monetize carbon, if you can fix carbon in materials, that's a, that's, a, that's a huge win. Aviation, this is an industry that desperately needs a biofuel. Why does it desperately need a biofuel? Because I would suggest that no one in this room will get into an electrically powered plane. Yeah, we can see electric powered cars, got it, yeah, I can trust that. Electrically powered plane, no way. And, uh, and they get that, yeah. No one's talking about electrically powered planes for that very reason. Uh, but also, uh, and, and so this is an industry that, I mean, what's that? a fully loaded 747 consumes 16 tons of fuel taking off. So the volumes are big, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, the, the price of their gas is volatile, and legislation is coming in place right now to penalize that industry, particularly in Europe, that industry is being penalized. And so they're motivated now to ensure, and I've got to get the wording of this right, they have a formal commitment to, be, to have carbon neutral growth by 2020. What does that mean? That as that industry grows, that their, their footprint will not grow with it. Um, and, and so they're desperate to find routes to, uh, to new fuels. There's a bunch of routes uh, that, uh, that are out there. These are depicted here. Uh, Sasshole were the first to develop a new type of gas that didn't come, uh, uh, sorry, a new type of aviation fuel that didn't come from, uh, from gasoline, uh, but it did use coal or natural gas. Um, Kior, uh, uh, a company in the States, developed a pyrolysis technology. Uh, they've gone some, through some rough, rocky times recently, but they, had a, they have a, a pyrolysis process to, to basically take wood, turn it into an oil that can be uh, upgraded to, to aviation fuel. The algae guys, of course, want to use their 
oils for, for uh, aviation fuel. And then you have the, the, the alternative alcohol producers such as GIVO and Cobalt who are fermenting sugars into butanol, uh, isobutanol and n-butanol respectively and ourselves who are all looking at alcohol to jet a new process, ATJ, and we're looking to certify that process in order to produce high volumes of jet fuel for the aviation industry. I should quickly mention here uh, Amaris. Amaris are a company, again, they're fermenting sugars to produce a, a, a 15 carbon molecule called farnazine. This, uh, this fascinating picture here, apparently that's farnazine. And um, they're doing this in, in, in collaboration with Total. Uh, they did a flight this year with a, a, a Gol, I don't know if that's what you call them, Gol, uh, Brazilian airline. Uh, flying from Atlanta, no, Orlando, to Sao Paulo uh, with a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a plane containing, uh, using fuel that was 10% farnazine. So that's, that's on its way. I wanted to quickly talk about ATJ, alcohol to jet. That's a, a process that we're, we're heavily involved in, in looking to certify, um, as are GIBO and Cobalt. They're using butanol, we're using ethanol. The, the alcohol is produced by our respective technologies and then that alcohol is dehydrated, oligomerized, so made into a chain, and uh, hydrogenated and turned into a jet. The really good news is that the guys who uh, certify jet fuel are uh, pretty meticulous. <laughs> this is a, a two-year process. I fly a lot, so I'm quite happy that uh, they spend a lot of time making sure the fuel's good. Um, and we're going through that process now to certify a process for the production of jet fuel uh, from, from alcohols, the ATJ, alcohol to jet uh, uh, process. And we're about, I think, two thirds of the way through that, that certification uh, track now. Uh, our partner, oh, sorry, our, our, our fuel looks very good. So the way you get this, this thing certified is one, you get the fuel analyzed, it, it meets, a meets a bunch of specs, then you go through engine testing at various scales using various volumes, uh, look for batch consistency, and et cetera. This is just a, a slide showing that the, the properties of the fuel produced from ethanol uh, uh, are, are, uh, match those uh, that the STM uh, recommended or, or deem necessary uh, for, for a jet fuel. We can do this because we can produce fuel ethanol at very low cost. And obviously what we're looking to do is take it, ethanol molecules and join them end to end. So uh, the final, a single molecule of jet fuel uh, will be multiple molecules of ethanol joined together. And you can only really make that pay if you can produce the ethanol at low cost in the front end. Um, and we've got some good partners on this. We have Virgin Atlantic as an off-take off partner, and they're uh, committed to buy whatever uh, jet fuel we produce uh, through, through this process. So a few closing thoughts. I've still got, I've got two minutes. <laughs> um, <laughs> a few closing thoughts. Policy. So this is what I'll talk about bio. What's bio got to do with anything? Why, why biofuel? Why do, we, why, do we, why do we care that a fuel is made from biomass? Personally, I think it's, my, my personal view is it's, it's a, a kind of misguided focus. It's a very easy thing to sell politically, but it doesn't make any sense because actually what we want to do is not consume biomass for the production of fuel. What we want to do is produce a fuel that emits less carbon. So we should be talking about low carbon fuels, we shouldn't be talking about biofuels, we should be much more, policy should be much more technology agnostic in its, in its approach to this space, allowing innovators to develop fuels that allow less, or, or that, that result in low, less, less or fewer carbon emissions. Today, for example, we can produce electricity very cheaply without terminal carbon production. Solar today in many geographies is competitive with uh, uh, electricity produced from coal. Um, carbon is needed, not for electricity production, it's not, we, you know, therefore we, we, can, we can detach CO2 emission from electricity production to some degree in some places, but it is needed for chemicals, it is needed for energy dense fuels that, that are in aviation. And our, our view is that we should think about <laughs> recycling carbon. We don't think about, we, we think about recycling plastic bottles, we don't think about recycling carbon and that needs to be become part of our our lexicon. Um, it doesn't matter what that says. Um, <laughs> our process does that. With every tonne of fuel ethanol we produce from a steel mill, we, av we avoid the, the, the emission of 1.8 uh, uh, tonnes of carbon, 3 tonnes of uh, particulate matter, 3 kilograms of particulate matter, and numerous kilograms of, of, uh, of NOx and SOx. And this is why this is important. 
This is, the, this is what the air is like in, in, in Auckland in terms of particulate matter in the air. PM 2.5 level of 10. That's what Auckland's like. and we, well, It's lovely, yeah? That's what it's like in Delhi. 152. <laughs> this is what it's like in major cities in, in China. And, and so it's actually these, these issues are, uh, are driving uh, environmental legislation in these countries in the same way that they drove environmental, environmental legislation in Northern Europe and in the States in the earlier part of last century. Why bio? I keep, I keep making this point, why bio? Bio, bio is irrelevant. What is relevant is what the fuel, what the, how the fuel performs. How the fuel performs in terms of its impact on CO2 emission. And so really we, we, we as a society shouldn't care whether or not a farmer was employed to make a fuel that's low carbon because our aim is to avert climate change or slow climate change and that's about low CO2. So this quickly, so one of the things that we, we're working on LensTech is the direct use of CO2 um, and that's a process, this is a very, very, this is a very, um, I suppose cutting edge process. We're doing this in collaboration with the University of North America. Uh, electrosynthesis is the is the is the process whereby electrons can be used as a as a source of energy for CO2 fixation. Uh, these organisms can can uh, can can use electrons as a source of reducing equivalents and and use CO2 as a source of carbon. It's exciting. It's earlier stage than algae, so it's it's more than 10 years away. Um, in conclusion, therefore, my view is we need, we need to have, have a, we need diversification. We need a diversification of the, of, the, of the energy options and we need diversification of the feedstocks that we access for the production of low carbon fuels because the mountain we have to climb is measured in hundreds of billions of gallons of annual production of low carbon fuels. And the available technologies we have today simply won't get us anywhere near that. There'll be an order of magnitude off. So we have to think, we have to think about diversification and we have to broaden our view as to, as to uh, how we approach the area of sustainable fuel production. Questions? I do like this.